Hello, this is Dennis Polis with another in the series of Open Philosophy videos. In this video, we'll be continuing our discussion of the laws of nature by looking at the question of their universality. This question is important because it impinges on such issues as free will and determinism. Earlier in our series on the laws of nature, we found that Newton's great insight was that the same laws applied both here on Earth and throughout the universe. We also learned that Newton's laws, although simple, did not describe the motions of the planets with the same accuracy as the Ptolemaic system. Newton therefore made no claim that his laws were universal in the sense of being the ultimate descriptions of reality. Around the beginning of the 19th century, Pierre Laplace published his work on celestial mechanics. In it, he took account of the effects of the large planets, Saturn and Jupiter, and so showed that Newton's laws were able to provide the same degree of accuracy as the Ptolemaic system. Armed with this success, he made a statement which has become a pivotal theme in modern science. An intelligence knowing, at a given instant of time, all the forces acting in nature, as well as the momentary positions of all things of which the universe consists, would be able to comprehend the motions of the largest bodies of the world and those of the smallest atoms in one single formula, provided it were sufficiently powerful to subject all the data to analysis. To it, nothing would be uncertain. Both future and past would be present before its eyes. Laplace's statement raises many issues and deserves more analysis than we have time for here. We will take up some of these issues in future videos. Here, however, we want to look at the justification behind Laplace's statement. Laplace had no empirical knowledge of atoms. All he had really done was to show that Newton's laws could explain the orbits of the planets with great precision. He then assumed that these or similar laws would apply to the rest of the universe. In doing this, he fell into a cultural mindset that goes back to the mechanical philosophers of the 17th century. Thomas Hobbes, for example, had believed that everything, including the human mind, could be explained mechanically. So Laplace's statement is based on a cultural mindset and the direction that science seemed to be going in rather than any history of accomplishment. Still, if we look at the history of science, we find an ever-widening realm of application. If we go back before the publication of Newton's Principia, say to 1680, we find that physics has only explained a very few phenomena, such as trajectories and oscillations. Most scientific problems remained open. The cause of planetary motion, the nature of light, electricity and magnetism, understanding chemical reactions, free will, and consciousness. As a result of the publication of Newton's Principia, by 1800, mechanics was well in hand. The nature of light was still an open question, as were the laws of electricity and magnetism. Work was beginning on chemistry, and the origin of species appeared as a new problem. Little progress had been made on free will or consciousness. By 1900, science had explained the laws of electricity and magnetism and those of chemistry. Darwin and Wallace had published a theory of evolution to explain the origin of species, and there was a general feeling of optimism that all of the fundamental problems of science had been solved and only the details needed to be worked out. Yet there were some nagging details that remained unexplained. The Michelson-Morley experiment had failed to detect ether drift, theory and observation did not quite agree on the details of Mercury's orbit, and standard physics was not able to explain black body radiation or the photoelectric effect. Also, no progress had been made on the problem of free will or of consciousness. By the end of the second millennium, quantum and relativistic phenomena were understood, and the Big Bang Theory provided an outline for understanding the origin of the universe. Life chemistry seemed to be well in hand. But new problems have emerged. Quantum gravity is not understood, nor is dark energy or dark matter. Small delays in the arrival times of gamma rays from cosmic events may undermine the general and special theories of relativity. And yet again, no progress has been made on explaining free will or consciousness. In fact, there is a growing acknowledgement that the problem of consciousness is a hard problem in the sense that the standard methods of science provide no traction in dealing with it. 
Thus, the range of application of scientific laws may be limited when it comes to the mind. Why might this be so? The answer becomes pretty obvious when we reflect upon it. As we have seen in previous videos, knowledge results from an interaction between knowing subjects and a known object. In doing natural science, we don't care about the knowing subjects, we care about the objects in nature. As a result, we fix on them and abstract away both the experiential interactions and the knowing subjects. As a result, we have objective, observer-independent data on the objects of our interest, namely the objects in nature. However, when we turn to the mind, which is the core of human subjectivity, we have no data because our method has been specifically designed to filter out subjective data. In other words, because the scientific method has been designed to be objective, which is a good thing in dealing with the objects of nature, it filters out data on subjectivity, which is the very thing that we are trying to study when we are considering the mind. That is why consciousness is a hard problem for the current scientific method. Next time we will be continuing our discussion of the laws of nature by considering the issue of causality.